Uh, happy birthday. Good morning. Happy birthday. <laughs> Welcome to everyone uh, to share with me and my friend uh, Hans uh, this moment. Uh, and uh, I introduced a little bit Hans and uh, myself too, and Mario Cristiani, uh, one of the three founders of Galleria Continua with my other two friends, uh, Maurizio Rigillo and Lorenzo Fiaschi. In 1990, we go in this adventure, open the gallery and uh, cultural association in San Gimignano, and uh, immediately we will be in Belgium, where we meet uh, another friend in common between me and Hans, Jacques Morens was a great friend of also of uh, me and also of the gallery and also of the artists like Hans. And uh, now today we talk a little bit about uh, the next uh, uh, adventure. Now, because uh, of the COVID we have uh, in the streaming, for that we are in Art Basel, uh, in online Art Basel and also what we was in program in San Gimignano, like a great show of ants, now we see a little bit uh, pills and uh, ants explain a little bit uh, what he have in mind to do in San Gimignano, we see online and uh, I think we discuss a little bit about that with... Yeah, uh, yeah so uh, at the studio we are uh, uh, finishing the works that would normally be presented physically at the studio uh, at the gallery in San Gimignano and uh, the title of the show is The Horseman and Other Stories and uh, we made a little film at the studio um, that we can could show now uh, to give an impression of the works that we are currently working on so the works are not finished yet as you might notice from the video uh, they still need uh, need some coating and some uh, finishing uh, touch and some extra props. Um, but uh, the video will give an impression of uh, what we're heading for uh, at the studio for the moment. Lula, we, we can see the video of the piece you have made. That's... Yes, so we just filmed at the studio and uh, I'm ready to show the video. So let's try to, to get it started now. And we see each other after those eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you. In addition to my installations, sculptures, films, watercolors, uh, theater and opera work, I've been creating autonomous sculptures of human figures for a number of years now. And although numerous women, men and children have posed in my studio over the years, these sculptures are not portraits of them, but rather fictional figures, uh, characters who alone or in a dialogue with a second person tell a universal story in which timelessness and topicality are brought together. With the horseman and other stories, I will mainly present elaborately detailed um, human figures um, that are mostly depicted in a moment of rest or while performing a trivial daily action. The Horseman, a life-size sculpture of a man on a horse, presents us with an enigmatic nomadic horseman, a figure that evokes both the lonely traveler of all times and the homeless migrant of today in search of a better life. His companion is a little monkey sitting on his shoulder, holding a parasol in his hand to protect his owner from the sun. The horse carries handy work tools on the flanks and small collections of banal as well as quite mysterious objects that presumably are of great importance to the traveler. As you can see, there are also a rolled up sleeping bag and a trumpet in its luggage. The boatman is a life-size statue of a man with his dog on a small rowing boat. 
seemingly pushing the boat away from a bank. Like the horseman, he is a homeless loner, a middle-aged man halfway through life, always on the move. He has packed his whole life together on this small boat, means of survival, personal belongings and goods that he can offer for sale or exchange are stacked and tied up in an improvised way. Mum and Dad is a sculpture of an aged couple on the lookout, both in their dressing gowns, as if something happened on the street at night, and they want to find out what's going on from the doorway. I think and hope their body language and facial expressions uh, speak volumes about their age and, and their relationship. This work, The Cliff, shows an adolescent couple sitting atop a headland on the edge of the precipice. The girl's open gaze lingers in the distance as if preoccupied with something beyond the setting while the boy's attention is entirely focused on her. I think it's a, it's a bittersweet image of young love's vagaries laced with innocence and designed to appeal to the viewer's sentiment. The story of childhood, of growing up, is represented as a form of sublime enchantment, punctuated by the overwhelming perception of a world not yet lived, to which we are enticed to return. It sort of highlights my recurring concern with change, where different stages of our lives are punctuated with the weight of waiting before transitioning into a new phase. Here, the arrival of first love signals the passage into adulthood and the loss of innocence. Sleeping Girl Home is a scaled-down version of the previously realized life-size work of a sleeping girl on a Chesterfield sofa. As foyers, we look into the room in which she is located, where other furniture, such as a large library cupboard and plants are present. Through the windows of the room, a kind of evening sunlight falls inside, making the quiet mood tangible. The hideout is a showcase I designed, made here at the studio with on the inside a sculpture of a nocturnal landscape on scale. At the highest point of the unruly rocky landscape is a bare tree with a treehouse in which a light burns as if someone is present. The background of the landscape is a starry sky. I think the scene appears like an almost fairy tale like congealed memory. Lily is a sculpted, classic still life of a most slender table with a draped tablecloth and a vase with a graceful branch with lily flowers. The extreme verticality of the work emphasizes its vulnerability, as well as the feeling of the flowers reaching up to the sky. This work, Dog, is a life-size sculpture of a sleeping dog. A very simple and everyday scene. I can't say too much about it or add too much about this work other than that it speaks for itself. It speaks about the calm and the tranquility of the passing of time. This Vanitas variation is a monochrome grey sculpture of a baroque still life on a tablecloth in which by free association Classical and contemporary ornamented elements were brought together to form a visually festive whole. Nevertheless, as befits the Vanitas tradition, it is also a memento mori. Lisa and Stephanie, large watercolor paintings, are the first of a new body of works. This series portrays men and women of different backgrounds and ages in a relaxed sitting or lying position. They look the spectator directly in the eye. 
Due to the large dimensions of the works, the characters are perceived as life-size, which I hope creates a great directness. Although they all clearly find themselves in the calm of an interior, I improvised dreamy landscape elements in the background or around them. It seems that these additions are an extension of their reflective mood. As a whole, I hope the exhibition will speak about our growing pains, the search for identity, the difficulties of communicating, the awkwardness inherent to our existence, but also about our dreams and hopes for a better future and the search for inner peace and wonder. Wonderful dance. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving us this uh, possibility to see what you normally share in the space of the gallery, but uh, it's very, very emotional also to see and uh, listen your uh, explication. Um, yes, we have uh, opened this uh, way together, in the first exhibition in 2007, but uh, Jack Morris bring us together before. Uh, if you remember when Krista Vive gave this uh, metamorphosis in San Gimignano, you bring one video there, and that was very impressive for me. And from that moment after we keep in touch, you made many adventures with us uh, in the space uh, in San Gimignano, in Paris, somewhere in Le Moulin, uh, in China, in Havana. So you, you are connected also our story and with your uh, imaginary trip. And, um, I remember also the very good experience, a beautiful uh, view you have made, especially for our Basel in Art Unlimited, the House of Collectors, Location 6, uh, and uh, but you are very very art artist with the 360 degree now because you don't made only this view and with your way in art but also in the theater in the music uh, i remember the beautiful song uh, sea of tranquility and the beautiful video you have made in many many places in many emotional moment of uh, see my mind and the mind of other friends follow your work and uh, nothing uh, what do you tell me about this uh, new project the, uh, uh, yes um, stories uh, so the works we are finishing now for um, our online presentation um, at my studio um, are works in which I think I, I'm more using, um, let's say, a sort of uh, a form of fiction that uh, also includes a bit of uh, uh, fantasy or fantastic elements, you know, elements from um, a form of fiction that is not just representing reality, but that also contain something fairy tale like or something. Uh, enigmatic um, because I think in these times we maybe uh, need a bit of not the poetic escape but something that is that goes further than just uh, commenting the actuality for example uh, Mario you me you mentioned uh, Sea of Tranquility which to me was a big Gesamtkunstwerk it was a big project that included video sculptures uh, watercolor paintings and it was presented as a, a sort of a, a fictitious museum dedicated to the newest, largest cruise liner to date. And in that regard, it was surely uh, a social comment on, uh, let's say, the, um, um, how, how the world functions, uh, the, the dialectics, uh, how the 
um, the boat was uh, divided, this big cruise line and boat, it was like uh, Fritz Lang's uh, metropolis, uh, like the people working in the belly of the ship or the workers that don't have access to the upper deck. So there was a hierarchy on board of the ship that is explained so much about power and about uh, um, how, how things uh, function uh, or dysfunction and how unfair they can be. Um, and I was reflecting a lot on, uh, on leisure and um, uh, how we produce shopping malls and things have to, have to be delivered like yesterday always and uh, there's no time for anything. And um, so there was a lot of uh, social reflection or thinking about uh, uh, the topicality, about the actuality uh, in, in those works. While now for the, the new show at Continua that we will be having online instead of physically, uh, I thought that I would love to launch uh, some um, characters that have something uh, special about them that is not just daily life like uh, by itself. So mostly when I sculpted life-sized characters at my studio, uh, it was people doing very simple things, like a, a young boy playing with marbles uh, or um, someone picking blackberries. Uh, and now the horseman is like all of a sudden a man of a horse. Of course, it's not an innocent idea uh, since there are many uh, statues that glorify like uh, kings and, and queens and... Um, uh, for example, in Belgium, of course, we now have like the enormous critique on um, uh, Leopold II, uh, who had been like a, um, yeah, a, a, a racist king, you could say, in, in, in regard that uh, it was a, a highly problematic uh, era uh, when he was ruling uh, for Belgium, uh, Belgium with its presence in Congo and so on and so forth. So now worldwide, of course, we have seen how people are uh, totally understandably uh, reacting towards those uh, sculptures or statues of people that are glorifying like a past that is ethically totally wrong. And so by producing a nomadic figure, uh, like um, almost like a, a kind of a refugee figure or someone that is uh, on the road, uh, a homeless character um, that refers both to Don Quixote as well as to, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, there are many people that you can pr project onto this uh, fictitious character, uh, but it's not just, um, let's say, a nowadays person. So it's more like a universal character that uh, we can find, um, that we can understand as someone who is not in power or in charge, uh, like a king or a queen or a, a politician, but rather someone like us, but then... Um, with uh, some additional mystery around him because he's he has for example this little monkey on his shoulder holding a parasol which is like uh something very fairy tale like and unexpected maybe and uh it's a trumpet. Trumpet. yes excuse me yeah he has a trumpet <laughs> in his in his luggage as well but for example the boatman is is again also this kind of story of a man on the go a man on the road someone on the road but it's just a it's it's not like um, a glamorous character it's just a, a very daily life like character yet uh, from his baggage you can understand uh, what he's doing like he has his personal stuff he has his um, the goods that he can trade in order to survive so he has his entire life packed uh, onto this little rowing boat and um, so what I tried to do was to create uh, personas, to create figures, to create characters that are not straightforwardly um, one-dimensional, but that could be filled in by the reader or uh, the, the spectator in, in, in many different ways. It also, I, for me, was also this uh, image of the emigrant part of Don Quixote, very, very, very interesting. But also the immigration for a better life was also the white people. Yes. Not only the people now who try to come in Europe or in uh, America or in the 
rich country, but uh, also many people going from the, the, the colonial years. <laughs> there was uh, people are uh, they search another life. And also the adventure of this uh, man on the horse, like uh, and a curious man, is a, maybe an artist or I don't know what. It's important also to see if uh, put in mind have not only one way to to in, interpretation of uh, this uh, movement of vagabondism <laughs> of the, the humanity. And I think uh, your way to put also the trumpet, the monkey, is the one way to understand the, this uh, part of curiosity to keep in touch with other uh, part of culture of the world. And before was also not uh, only the colonialism, but the experience of the humanity. And I think also today we try to go with the artists like you in another way to keep in touch by the culture. <laughs> yes, it's. Um, uh, I also started to produce watercolor paintings now uh, of life-sized uh, people, men and and women, so um, of different age and different social backgrounds, um, because the the question of identity, of course, is also a very urgent one nowadays. Well, it always has been, but also like, how do you see yourself? Um, like, uh, I, I have people posing who have clearly some, uh, let's say, subcultural uh, things like special haircut or tattoos or piercings or, um, or an extremely long beard and, and long hair. And, uh, but they're all posing in a very calm uh, way, like an almost uh, introspective kind of way silent and uh, sunk in, in thoughts and um, so there is a, a great calmness that comes from them at the same time they're they're looking at you they, they look at, at they look you in the eye and um, I, I somehow wanted to it's like when you stand in front of the mirror and and you think who the heck is this right uh, it's your it's your body and uh, but but then of course um, to understand uh, whether this face, this, the, the physical uh, house of your soul, whether that represents you or not, and what you do with it, and how it appears. And um, so this, this idea of how do you identify yourself? How do you create an identity? How do you see yourself? Um, I, I wanted to touch upon these things with these uh, watercolors uh, of quite specific young, younger and older people um, just posing for you and looking at you. And you don't know who they are. And as a matter of fact, it's not that important that you know who they are. In that sense, as I said in the video, these are not portraits, but rather a sort of a mirror uh, for the spectator. Um, it's not about them, but it's more about uh, a gaze and, and how you how you relate and how that reflects back to you. Yeah, very. Thank you. No, I uh, remain a little bit about the the watercolor. You remember when uh, born this adventure with Anna Coliva and Villa Borghese, <laughs> inside <Yeah. a> conversation <laughs> with Correggio. And uh, which was the beginning, of, was very important project, no? Because uh, Anna Coliva and Villa Borghese try to connect and choose your work for keep in touch with a uh, classical artist. And I think also for you was uh, an interesting process from this moment. And uh, if you'd like to tell a little bit about uh, yes, from that time to this, because this large uh, painting. Yeah. For me, also, I was surprised. I was afraid. Yes, I, know. <laughs> I remember. It uh, was a big uh, solution you have taken in this time. And after the, your watercolor is magic. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, when I, I studied painting uh, in, in the bachelor degree, and then afterwards I did a master's in what was then called the experimental studio at the art college in Brussels. 
And um, so I, I started to make, as a teenager, I was uh, drawing comic books. Um, I was always drawing, um, but then uh, when I was in my 20s, and my, when I started to, to study art, um, I more and more moved towards uh, sculpture, photography, and video. And then it took a very long time before I dared to show drawing. Um, and I started with tiny little watercolors, um, of which I thought, shall I dare to show them or not? Because, you know, I feel more conf confident in, uh, in sculpture or in, um, in photography or video. And in fact, uh, when uh, through you, through you uh, Mario, I got in touch with uh, Anna Koliva of the Galleria Borghese. It was the first time that I thought, since I was invited to have a dialogue with the old master Correggio, I thought if I would put a video installation at the Galleria Borghese, it would too, too much be like a, a, a dialectic position. Like I am the contemporary one with new media and there is the old masters. So I was really thinking like, what can I do? And I remember I had very little time. <laughs> I had only like, I don't know, a month or two months to, to make the show. So the invitation uh, arrived a bit uh, uh, in an Italian way, quite, <laughs> quite uh, uh, at the last moment. Uh, and I was thinking, what can I do? And then I, I told you, Mario, that I would be making large watercolor paintings and it was uh, a bit out of my comfort zone because i i had not uh, shown any throughout any uh, exhibition uh, before that so before 2009 there was no big watercolors huh? and so the galleria borghese was the first platform and i remember that you were quite nervous <laughs> whether i could pull it off or not and and I was the same, but at the same time, I thought yeah. to respect the old masters, it is a, a very discreet presence to have work on paper. And now we're happy that the work is in the collection of the Maxi in, in Roma. Um, and uh, since then, I've been making those big watercolor paintings, and I have made about 400 of them by now. And I once calculated that, is more, that I made more than a kilometer of watercolor by now. <laughs> Uh, yeah. um, maybe we have now the, the question from the person in contact with us uh, if you like to yes to talk with the people uh, if you are fine I read what they have sent or yes that's lovely. my English is not the best <laughs> but, uh, I have uh, I have uh, one question is uh, Hans, I love the presentation of your new works and I was especially impressed by the new series of watercolor, amazing. I was also very much impressed by the hideout. I'm familiar with your beautiful showcase with a sorts of object inside and I was particularly touched by this new work where you are placing a landscape inside the showcase. The light inside the cabin, the luminosity of the stairs, the dark sky are so poetic. The rocks remind me Giotto landscape, and I like to know more about this work and the your approach representing landscape. I read good. Eh? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. At, at some point, I started to I, I designed like a showcase, like a piece of furniture, because in fact I could not find an existing one that that was appealing to me or that, that seemed to be like the right one for me uh, because I love the idea of a window on the world which is of course the whole principle of a painting and uh, in, in, in this case when you make a three-dimensional window or a showcase uh, it allows you to go in, into three dimensions it's not a frame of a, of a painting or a drawing it is like it has a depth so one can sculpt something inside uh, and I like the idea that there are drawers uh, inside uh, the cupboard, uh, cupboard uh, or inside uh, the piece of furniture uh, that suggests that there's something else inside as well. Um, these landscapes are uh, things I, I just improvise so I start to cut 
uh, them out of polystyrene. That's the first shape. And then later on, I um, make a mold and I make them into another material. Um, but I heard the reference of, of Giotto, uh, if I was not mistaken. I was also thinking of uh, very early uh, landscape paintings, like the landscapes of uh, Patini, for example, <clears throat> when the landscape genre within the history of painting for the first time uh, developed itself as a, as a genre by itself, and not just as a fill-up for the background for uh, characters that uh, were uh, portrayed by the painters. And it's true, like, there is some, some sort of a fantasy element about uh, the rocky landscapes that I sculpted over the years, and that I also sculpted for this particular work, for the hideout. Um, because it's like, when I start to draw without any photographic documentation, I draw a bit more comic book-like. So when you look at uh, the rocks, for example, uh, painted by uh, Flemish painters uh, in the like in the Renaissance period, uh, they did not necessarily travel to Switzerland or Italy. So in Belgium, we simply don't have like rocky mountains. Mm -hmm. So it's a very flat. It's not as flat as the Netherlands, but <laughs> we only have some hills, let's say, but not really. We don't have mountains. So the way that people from this region, where I come from. We're painting uh, mountains or uh, rocky uh, landscapes. They had it from other painters who had traveled to Italy and made some sketches. Of course, there was no photography. Yeah. So it's like when people for the first time started to paint a line, for example, huh? they only had it through uh, depictions of others and they had, didn't have a clue. They never saw the animal in real. Mm -hmm. And so you have these very strange lines, you know, in the early painting, as well as you have like the strange rocks uh, in, the, um, in, in the period where, uh, you know, where we had, for example, the Flemish primitives, uh, the, the painters that did not yet master uh, the concept of perspective, how you draw perspective. So mm -hmm. everything looked a bit naive in, in how it was layered and presented both nature and animals. And um, I have some of that in these works where I improvise rocks and I know that, that they are not looking entirely credible or photographically credible. And uh, someone who knows something about geology would say like, that's not how a rock looks like, right? <laughs> so there is something of a, a fantasy element in it. And with the hideout, uh, of course, it's also a fantasy that there would be a tree atop of, uh, of, a, of a big rock, which of course is probably not the case because where should the roots go of that tree? And then there's a tree house in it. So there is something very childish and, uh, and, and dreamlike uh, about, this, uh, about this showcase with, uh, with the hideout, with the, with the tree tree house in the tree. <laughs> yeah, the, the tree is very nice. Also the play of language. Uh, Elisabetta has sent another message. He Hans, thank you for your this event. I'm curious about who come first, the artist or the dramatist. At this point, your experience in the contemporary art were the, in the theater, what the relationship between the two components of your work. Will you continue to bring them forward together or do you imagine a future more committed to one rather than the other? Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I will always be a visual artist in the first place. Uh, and I was, you know, when some years ago, um, the intendant of the Schauspiel Frankfurt, the big theater in Frankfurt in Germany, asked me to write, direct, to write and direct a theater play and to do the stage design and costumes for it. I was so flattered that someone considered me a playwright or potential, a, a potential play, a playwright and a theater director uh, that I could not refuse. And uh, it was a wonderful production and it was very well received and it was a lovely collaboration with the actors. And um, I think it has to do with the fact that um, as, an, as an artist, I feel that I'm uh, an author uh, in the true sense. 
So in that sense that if they would ask me to direct uh, an existing play, for example, um, it would be less challenging to me or it would feel less, a bit less creative than when I write the play myself. So the challenge is bigger. Uh, but there are also advantages, like when I wrote and directed my first uh, theater play uh, uh, for the theater in, in Frankfurt, uh, of course I had to, I had the, the big advantage that I could be totally disrespectful towards my own text. <laughs> you know, when you direct uh, uh, Samuel Beckett, then you have to stay totally with the text it's like holy, like you can't touch it. And if you do, then people are commenting or, you know, are blocking you from, do, uh, from doing it. So I have all liberty to fool around during the rehearsal process with my own text, um, uh, to take things away and, and, and to rethink or to rewrite. Even during the directing, I also often rewrite or write new parts uh, which you can't really do when you're doing a repertoire or existing uh, plays um, so the the fact that everything comes together like the visual aspect of doing the stage design the costumes the lights uh, the text uh, and directing it as a whole is very close to how i operate as a visual artist and in that sense, I, I don't feel that much difference uh, in, the, in the creation. The biggest difference is when I do something in the performing arts is that it is uh, the here, that you have the here and nowness of theater, which is incredible. Huh? The lights go out and the audience is seated in the dark and <laughs> the stage uh, gets, it, gets its light and uh, the first word is being said and um, this feeling of it's happening here and now is, is something magical that I can never deliver in a video piece uh, or that I, I cannot really have in, a, in an immersive installation. A big immersive installation like the Collector's House I, I presented at Art Basel is of course an experience, a physical experience, but it's less here and now than the theater because the theater invites you to follow the duration of an hour, two hours of live performance um, language that, that is spoken uh, there, um, that is emotion that is uh, triggered, that is happening there at that very moment uh, through the presence of, of people. Huh? Uh, while of course my installations are without people, they're like deserted locations. It is a different feeling. So it is less here and now. It, yes, it is immersive, but it's just another option. And I never dreamt of doing uh, theater uh, or I never thought that I would be um, in the opera world as I start to be now. Uh, I directed and stage designed uh, Bluebeard's Castle of Bartok for the Opera of Stuttgart um, a while ago. And, uh, and all of a sudden I, I feel that I'm enjoying to work with people to bring something live and uh, to try to guide them and to, to, to create it. But uh, for me, there is no hierarchy. I, I just hope that I will always be the visual artist doing some other things as well, rather than becoming, uh, just the, uh, becoming a performing arts person uh, solely. So, um, it feels like enriching and um, I love to be out of the comfort zone. Uh, in 2022, I will be directing uh, and doing the stage design of a brand new opera. Uh, it'll be with choirists, uh, full uh, philharmonic orchestra, a lot of solo singers. I will have to design a lot of costumes. And I know already now that it's gonna be very, very, it will be way more than Bluebeard's Castle of Bartok I did in the Opera of Stuttgart. This opera will be way more challenging on many, on many levels. And I'm a bit scared, but at the same time, I think, well, this gives the right adrenaline that I think that as an artist, when you're truly creative, that you always have to go for. <laughs> Thank you, Ant. Very good, large explanation. I have another question about, I have many questions for that, if it's possible, you try to give, because I very, really I have other 10, 12 questions. For that is better, 
try to to go at the point. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Allora, uh, another question from Alice. She asks, uh, uh, in this moment of uh, your works are almost prophetic in relation to the moment that we have just experienced it and that in some way we continue the life. A long moment of si a silence for the coronavirus, no? this moment of... Uh, a long moment of silence avoided that has pushed us to direct our or gaze inwards, like your sculpture with closed eyes. Do you to suspend every activity to hone other intuitive abilities? Do you believe that this new collective experience can lead us to look at your works with greater empathy? Well, <laughs> um, I, I don't. I, I don't know. In fact, um, but but I, it's true. I think um, um, that having experienced this, these lockdowns all over, uh, that for sure that um, the works I've, I've been presenting, uh, their silence and their calm and their the feeling that they that they can transfer to the viewer um, I think uh, these times uh, might have encouraged people to be more receptive uh, indeed for uh, what I try to bring with the work um, it's it's uh, really strange like I have been for example in the year 2000 uh, I made a video of refugees in um, locked up uh, amidst, a, amidst a, a cargo in a truck. It was invited by Michelangelo Pistoletto to be part of the, uh, the biennial in Torino, I believe in 2002, if I'm not mistaken. And the video I produced in, uh, in the year 2000 or 2001, I don't uh, rem remember exactly, but by now that's already like, already like um, 20 years ago. And uh, so, so often I, I produce something long time ago that then all of a sudden comes back in, into the actuality uh, and the other way around. So the times that I was more uh, politically engaged or uh, more ex explicit, like this video about us uh, refugees in a truck, um, it was long time ago. And then all of a sudden it's, it's back uh, like... A major issue um, to, to being discussed or to being digested through art and sometimes in highly political times I, I made something that was like apolitical or really about a universal idea of the human condition rather than commenting on the actuality so it's always going back and forth and uh, and, and mingling in a way that I cannot predict but I understand uh, uh, the remark that maybe uh, some aspects of my work are might be better understood after this lockdown uh, period and uh, the rethinking of time and space that we were confronted with in this uh, condition. Uh, thank you, uh, Antonella Croci. He has. We met in your studio a few years ago. I have two questions for you. Apart from the show with Continua, which other project do you have in this period that, that could postpone it? Hopeful, not cancelled. Also, as we do <laughs> the real exhibition in San Gimignano uh, next time when uh, everything uh, is possible. Yes. Not cancel the project in San Gimignano, remember? No. Uh, the question is, uh, see, is it more or less the same of uh, the first question posed now in the, the lockdown? And uh, is uh, how, how has uh, your process of work been influenced by this period of lockdown? Did you focus more on a medium where you called work by yourself, such a watercolor imagine, mm -hmm. rather than a medium where you needed the support of others? Thank you, Antonella. Uh, well, uh, 
just just my first reaction was when there was a lockdown i in fact i could have because my my studio building is large enough and my team is small enough in order to to work safely on on the safe distance from uh, from one another so in fact i could have continued to work at the studio with the whole team but uh, i decided because of uh, yeah, just to being ethically correct towards uh, the outside world and, and you know, everyone that, that works at the studio. I thought, okay, we will close then. Uh, it's not that there was not enough work for us because we had a lot of work, in fact, um, to, to keep producing, like the big sculptures, uh, for example. Um, so that, uh, I closed the studio for five weeks and um, I have to say that I experienced this period as a very numbing uh, period. Um, it 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 made me more passive for some reason. Maybe it had to do with the isolation uh, that I was not seeing a lot of people. Um, like uh, I thought that this uh, lockdown would deliver me a, a wonderful feeling and a lot of inspiration for my writing, but it did not um, for some reason because uh, I think that. If you write, even when you isolate yourself totally, you still have to feel that the world is ongoing, that the flow and the energy of the world is still continuing uh, around you, even though that you yourself are sitting still, isolated at a table, writing. Uh, but then when you notice that the world has, uh, has been frozen uh, artificially because of the pandemic, um, you know this 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 um the silence becomes weighty and um in my case it was a bit blocking and i felt when i opened the studio again and the team came back and i came back i was so relieved i was so happy <laughs> that we could just start to work again uh collectively it's true when i'm by myself of course when i paint watercolor paintings or when i write it's a lonely activity nobody can help me with those and i have been painting but in general i must say that uh this lockdown period that i experienced and when i closed the studio was a bit a uh, difficult time yeah it was very strong for everyone but uh, it's interesting this uh Shall we imagine you, me too, I imagine you painting or writing because, but very interesting, the, the, the balance between what is outside and what is your silent experience in the moment when other story around the goal. So thank you, so very nice. Uh, another question from Jerome Vigny, who uh, was also in San Giovignano many times for seeing your work. It's fascinated by your watercolors. They are mysterious and poetic. A word of silence. Your portraying of individuals seems to be a new development. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah, that's a very interesting question because, uh, for example, when I started to make uh, installations and sculptures and photography and video, I would mostly have desolate places, you know, uh, depopulated, uh, left behind places. Uh, fictitious places that I would make up um, uh, but without any human presence and at some point I thought why am I not making sculptures of people and uh, it was because it's it's a very tricky thing to do when you sculpt people it's very easily like wrong taste or not credible or it's it's very very difficult so at some point I decided I have to confront myself with um, sculpting the human figure so i can discover what i can do with it and how it can become a dialogue with the spectator and in the watercolors it was the same i have already painted portraits of children and men and women but always with their eyes closed um, and in this case um, it was my challenge to have people posing for me uh, and looking the spectator straight in the eye that's something totally different than someone whose gaze is drifting away or uh, who's not really looking at you or has his or her eyes closed. So it is something new and it's something to explore for me. Um, to see how that can work 
Uh, also in the little film we showed today with the horseman and uh, the boatman, for example, those are some of the first sculptures where the, sculpt uh, the sculpted people also have their eyes open. So I started to make works like the teenage couple sitting on the cliff. That was the very first uh, sculpture I made of, human, uh, of, hu of the human figure, uh, where the sculptures are looking, that they have a gaze, that they have their eyes opened. And it's way more difficult in a, in a way than people with their eyes closed are always like internalizing and calm and serene to some extent. So to sculpt a gaze is very difficult. And to paint it, it's also difficult. And this is why I like to ex explore that now and what that implies. Yeah, so we have uh, many other questions, but uh, now maybe the time to... <laughs> Thanks to you, thanks to the people with us, uh, this, um, this conversation, uh, very interesting also for me every time to, uh, to listen your explication, your um, bring us and me in this world, uh, fantastic of uh, you, made by you. Uh, thank you everyone and- uh, Thank you so much. See you next time maybe. If you come in San Gimignano, <laughs> we try to give uh, the possibility to do an experience uh, small, but uh, uh, if you join us, uh, I hope in July and in the summer, we have uh, the possibility to meet in the short, the small group. And uh, we do the exhibition of ANS, uh, the good, uh, big exhibition next year, I think. Thank you, ANS. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Have Ciao, a lovely yes. day. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs>